welcome um, everybody to the last uh, talk, uh, Radical. Tonight we're welcoming back Denise Arnold, who's been um, listening in and taking part in our discussions for uh, quite, quite a long time, all through the COVID. Denise is a senior um, research fellow at University College London, and she has had long years of fieldwork in um, the Andes with Aymara people, writing books in both Spanish and English. Tonight's talk, which I know is a, is a really wonderful and engrossing talk, comes from one of those books or from the material of one of those books, Rivers of Fleece, Rivers of Song, um, and uh, this, this is a fascinating um, investigation of Andean cosmology and cosmogony uh, of the astronomy and what she has called a cosmic female-centered yama um, uh, ecosystem, um, interlinking women, the yamas, the sky, the earth, the seasons, um, and... Uh, and the darkness. The whole cosmos. Uh, the darkness, there will be a lot of darkness. So over to Denise. All right. Well, thank you very much to Camilla and to Chris and Rag for the invitation. Um, it, it, yes, it's about a book I, I wrote some time ago in 1998 uh, with my husband, Juan de Dios y Apita, who, who was an Aymara and a and I'm a speaker, so I had this great advantage that we could do field work together. And of course, he could carry out interviews fluently with um, the local people in our field work in Aymara language, uh, even though the variance between Lake Titicaca, where he was from, and, and the area much further south in Bolivia are quite different. He learned to pick it up um, fairly quickly. It took me a great long time to learn Aymara and I probably speak it more like a child, but I do write it quite well. So I'll share screen. Hold on. So is that all right? Can you see that? Yes. Um. So, um, this is the area where we worked. It's right. Um, down the south from La Paz, uh, around Lake Popo, and um, we work in, in the Kakachaka Ailu, which is here, although we've also worked in these other Ailus around Chaliapata, which is the local market town, uh, and we've worked there for several years. It's very difficult now because of the drug market. Um, but we knew this region very well. We'd also gone walking a lot in the north of Potosí, off to the east there, to visit people in Limey, where Olivia Harris did her, her famous work, and off to the Milma Valleys to the east, which belong to the Aymaya, which are part of the Hukumani group. And the Hukumani and the Kakachakas, apart from being herders and farmers, are, are warriors. You can see a kind of fight out here at Carnival to celebrate the dead. They're warrior societies and they're great rivals. And in the year 2000, there was a very nasty war of the Ailus with lots of dead and the American military involved and all kinds of things. Bolivia thought it had another Chiapas on its hands. My own contribution to the interviews we had with um, the people I, I am about to mention was my fascination with the world of women. Um, with women's bodies, we've been very interested in menstrual synchrony and the possibilities of since about the 1970s. And the female counterpart to these male warriors is through weaving and through childbirth. So the book is mainly about the songs to the animals sung by these women herders and weavers. But the relationship between songs and weaving in the Andes is primordial. Uh, this female power functions in parallel to male political power, which has been explored by Valdi Astvalsen and others, male incursions into oral history, Tom Abercrombie's work is about that, and Tristan Platt's work, for example, about male shamanic discourse. Um, 
I was more interested in this feminine power of, of the women's bloodline, which is called Wheeler Custer. They have this bilateral kinship system where marriage is patrilocal and the women move between the patrilines at marriage. And so this bloodline is seen as a kind of spider's web that crisscrosses between the male patrilines. Um, there were three main singers that we consulted who were very knowledgeable about, about this. Um, the first is Don Domingo Jimenez. Um, he was a yatiri or shaman or wise person and a male midwife. There's Juan up there taping him. He was an old friend of, of my husband's. He was a great regional political leader and um, a male midwife. Um, so, and, and he had many, many debates with doctors throughout Bolivia and South America about different ways of, of bringing children to being. Um, the second was Doña Lucia Quispe um, from Cacachaca. She was the daughter and wife of Yatiris, of, 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 of shamans, and a healer in her own right, and a midwife again. She gave me some of her healer's kit because her children having gone to Bolivian schools in those years, were taught to reject local tradition. And so she had no one to pass on this knowledge to. And then there was Doña Maria Aikalianque, also from Cacachaca, who was the wife of a local historian and a real character in her own right with a profound memory and a great skill in weaving and song. She was also a midwife. The, the kind of songs to the Camelids, in particular the llamas and alpacas, were already known in the early colonial period. For example, there's a comment in around 1613 by the indigenous chronicler Juan Poma de Ayala about them, and they probably date from long before. Of course, the songs to the sheep, the goats, the oxen, and so on date from the colonial period, as do the songs to the, the mules and the donkeys, which traverse the long exchange routes instead of the llamas between northern Argentina and market fairs such as those in Chaliapata, the local market town for the Cacachacas. So you've got many different influences coming in here, probably Inca influences. The Inca were in the region for a while. You've got these songs of the arrieros coming up from Argentina on these long trade routes. You've got medieval religious influences of songs, particularly the songs to the gods and the saints coming in from Europe through Spain and so on. We first heard the songs in different rituals in the animal marking ceremony, in the llama mating ceremony, in the cabildo tax gathering ceremony. And um, at first it wasn't a part of our main period of fieldwork. We transcribed them, visited the places mentioned in them because there are lots of um, powerful places mentioned and places with Ilya stones, these um, miniature stones that are very powerful for the Andean people. And, and we interviewed the singers numerous times. I mean, it must have been quite boring for them gradually explaining these things to us and then asking for their commentaries and exegesis about the songs. They always said that the songs are sung for their productive power and to honor the Virgin Earth. Um, the, the recordings we made, we generally try to make in more controlled conditions, but it always has to do with drinking a lot. So you had to drink along with the singers. Once they'd drunk quite a lot, then they would begin to sing. Um, historically, the importance of learning, herding and weaving for young women was probably a part of first menstruation rituals. And this, this was still the case in Inca times, include, um, as you can read in the chronicles. It must have been a similar situation to that in the lowlands as described in Pete Gao's studies of the Peru of Peru. This aspect is no longer accentuated in Cacachaca, although a lot of the menstrual symbolism remains. It's often centered in an Aymara term, Kama, which means both life and blood. And I'll, I'll return to that later. Young women celebrate the color of their blood in their weavings. So an adolescent's mantle might be like this one with large figures, lots of blood red in these plain areas. And here there are horses which have to do with a young girl's sexual energies and looking for young men. 
And if you compare that um, to this garment, it's a different kind of garment, an older woman's aksu, but you can see that the figures are scaled down and there are fewer areas of blood red, or, or if there are these stripes of blood red, they're, they're much smaller in scale. And, and that is a pattern throughout women's lives. Um, the threads of weavings are compared to female blood. And there's a constant allusion to this in women's weaving discourse. Um, similarly, singing to the animals is strongly related to the power of the color red. And the blood flow from the animal's ears, they do this animal marking ceremony through the female line, remembering the female line, the mothers and the grandmothers of all the animals and the corrals, the different corrals that they came from through the family lines. And when there's more blood flow from the ears of the most fertile females, there's a greater volume of sound in the songs. The older women singers have an esoteric language about these songs that the young girls pick up as they begin to inherit their own animals in their early teens. In Kakacheka, the girl's inheritance and her later marriage inheritance is mainly of herd animals from their parents, given in the animal marking ceremony from when they're quite small, and then they accumulate all these animals into a herd, and then they inherit the family weavings when they marry. In the animal marking ceremony, the participants mark their faces with lines, horizontal lines of blood. And this is called laka, a mouth, and it's said to announce the line of animals they will inherit and the luck that they'll accumulate when they, when these uh, animals that they inherit as small baby animals will grow up and, and reproduce into herds. And boys might inherit on these same occasions a few animals, but the male animals tend to be less important than the female breeding animals. And the boys tend to inherit land in general, as opposed to the girls and their animals. The classification of the songs to the animals, uh, they're called Wainyu, sometimes Warari, Waratanya, Aymaranya, because they're sung in Aymara, or sometimes just songs to the animals, Uyvapirti. Um, they relate to the classification of the animal fleece which the women breed carefully to get the colors they want for their weaving. So there's a kind of ethnogenetics that they carry out very carefully when the animals are crossing. They identify 12 kinds of song to the llamas and 12 colors of llama fleece are recognized. Um, by comparison, there are just three or four songs to the sheep and only this number of sheep colors are recognized. So you've just got black, white and a kind of dirty color. The importance of this number 12 seems to, maybe it has Christian influence from the 12 apostles and so on, but there's also this power of 10 in their counting, going back into Inca history and the use of people threads, plus a pair too, because they, they say number is a, number one is a kind of unfertile number because it's not completed, whereas two is like a couple, it's completed and it can have, it can reproduce offspring, so they play off this uneven and even system of counting. And they do it when they're counting the animals in many, many different ways. The llama fleece is also compared to the plumage of water birds. So many, many animals, uh, llamas are, are called geese or um, grebes or number of water birds in the region. When women talk about the origin of fleece colors, um, they often attribute it to the role of the hummingbird in the tale of the condor and the maiden. Um, it's a, a tale about the roar and the cooked, and it's about a failed marriage as a condor husband only gives, gives his wife raw meat to eat. He steals her when she's herding, takes, him up, takes her up to his airy nest on his back after persuading her to scratch his neck. Um, and it's about the tensions between matrilocal and patrilocal marriage in different regions. So the ending differs in one region and another, depending on these marriage rules. Um, in Kakachaka, the hummingbird is paid with a pelt of red or black wool for bringing the daughter secretly back to her parents' house from this, um, this uh, area high up on the mountains. And they hide her in a large cooking pot. The condor comes looking for her and either pecks the contents of the pot and kills the girl, or in other cases, more, uh, more matrilocal areas, he himself falls into a pot of boiling water and dies. 
in the tale, cooking meat is compared to cooking fleece. Fleece, fat, and meat are perceived as wrappings around the animals, and the women are in charge of these wrappings, so they have to ensure that the animals do have these plentiful coats of fleece, fat, and meat. An insistent motif in the songs and in the book um, is this one of red pathway, white pathway. We listen to Hanko Sinta. Um, it's a borrowing from the Spanish Sinta. Younger women relate these to the colors of the dust um, that the animals kick up when they go out at different times of year off to their pastures, red dust, white dust, or black dust, um, which they perceive as these colored ribbons or Sinta. However, for the older, knowledgeable women like Doña Lucia and Doña Maria, these refer not only to the terrestrial pathways um, of the animals, but also to their celestial pathways. And they're referring here to the so-called dark cloud constellations in the Milky Way, where the bright stars make a giant pathway through the blackness of the sky. These pathways have to do with the dwelling places of various beings. They say that the dead go there, the siren water spirits, the sirens go there. And then they have these kind of local variants of the little people or duendes, which they call here a maiku. These are associated with the dead and the rains. They visit the Aili each year at Todos Santos or the Feast of the Dead at the beginning of November. And then they're said to return each year after the rainy season to these dark cloud constellations of the Milky Way. Women are considered to be the mediators between the earth, the water, and the sky. And women's breath is compared to that of the virgin earth, which brings the rains. So you've got all of these different kind of cosmological elements in play. Women's power of song is related to the power in song performance of their breath, combined with the content of the alcoholic liquids they've imbibed, and they're often seen as like seeds of of maize, which is made into maize beer, so they've got seeds and breath mixed up. And the power of the voice is said to unravel like a ball of wool as they sing, and then they scatter the words like seeds, which help grow beautiful fleece on their animals, and hence the singers will be able to make beautiful weavings. Women say that they're wrapping their animals in song. There's a lexical similarity between the Aymara words for fleece, which is hawi, the lanolin or ointment of fleece, which is hawi, the word for river, which is hawira, for the Milky Way as the great river, which is hatka hawira, and the verb to drench, hawichanya, and then there's another term for birth, was coming out of the, of the mother, coming out of the womb, which is Hawi Mukunya. So you've got this Hawi with different suffixes. In this case, Hawi Mukunya, the suffix Muku, indicates shifting the baby to one side when it's born to avoid damaging its eyes, ears, or fontanelle with the amniotic liquid and other bodily fluids. Um, in talking about the songs, the women tend to mention two themes. These two pathways, red and white pathways, as pathways of growth, these are perceived by the singers to have resulted from sowing a seed or some granular element and its pattern of growth in filament-like extensions and how this occurs in multiple domains, human, animal, plant, minerals in the mines and so on. And then there's this notion of wrapping that I've also mentioned, um, irunya or grasping, katunya, which is in women's hands. Uh, it's about sound and breath. Song is sometimes called samanitanya, water and blood, um, and the color red and seed. So samana means both color at, and breath. And, and women say they're wrapping the newborn animals in song like clothes when they find them as little babies up in the mountainsides when they're out herding their animals and they wrap them in these songs to bring them down to the corrals to introduce into the human domain. So this links into things about shamanic discourse, about wrapping and healing in other cultures, such as the lowland Shipibo, Kornibo people, where shamans wrap their patients in, in sung designs to heal them. These same notions of wrapping have to do with midwifery and the wrappings of birth. 
and I mentioned how many of these uh, wise people are also midwives. They're often part of a hereditary line of people struck by lightning and initiated into healing during this process. The transformation of fleece into cloth is said to have to do with the dead in the heavens and their help in the transition of the animals from their place of origin, which they regard as being in these dark lake, lake constellations uh, and then coming down to earth. The black llama in the Milky Way is called Yakana in colonial Quechua accounts, such as the rites and traditions of Huarochiri. The etymology of this term is puzzling. Some authors say it means mosso, an initiation, uh, initiated Inca youth, although it might come from the term for black maize, kaya. It's also called hachataika, the great mother, and nowadays um, this is the main term used in Aymara of the zone. But the dark cloud constellations can also be called Tiaokota, black lakes. This is um, an illustration of a llama's back and they put ground maize flour on it mixed up with little sweets and coca leaves and chicha maize beer during the ritual of marking the animals. When the women talk about their songs, they make multiple allusions to the tactile qualities of something granular and something liquid. And so there's this idea that the fleece grows into long filaments from, from kind of roots embedded in the animal's body. And you've got this idea of sprouting filaments, which is all embedded into their agricultural language. And this is obviously quite old and goes back to like these archaeological drawings from um, early horizon Nazca of seed sprouting. So I would say that they're thinking as they're doing these rituals, uh, the participants are thinking in morphological terms that aid in the efficacy of the rituals. Um, they don't just think in like abstract terms like we do, but they're thinking in terms of things that grow and, and reproduce. And that thinking about it, they is helping into the efficacy of the ritual itself. The Argentine philosopher Rudolfo Kusch calls this seminal thinking. And I think it's very relevant here. When we come to the meaning of how we Mukunya, moving the newborn baby to one side as something between fleece and river, it seems to describe the birth of the flood waters that accompany this with the flow of amniotic liquid and the flooding with color and the flooding with song in the transition from monochromatics to brilliant color of redness in childbirth. There are some background, background to these ideas in other studies. In the 1950s in Bolivia, Eduardo Lopez Ribas wrote about the celestial white llama as star formations. He didn't seem to grasp the idea of the black celestial llama, which you can see here, um, much, like, much like the colonial chronicler Bernabe Cobo, who also identified the sky llama with the Lyra constellation of Cochilia. To more recent studies that begin to understand the importance of the dark cloud constellations beginning in the 1970s with Tom Zoidema and Gary Erton's work on these constellations. So this was my drawing of, of this Yama mother that you can see in here suckling her young. And then there's a condor, there's the Yama eyes constellation, there's a little fox in front of this Yama. Um, there are various people and other male Yamas coming behind. And in different regions, you're going to find slight variations on these ideas. Um, this is another more photographic idea where you can see the fox this time is going behind the mother and baby llamas. You've got a toad in front, um, a yutu, which is a, um, a cordonis, a quail, I think. Um, you've got a serpent there, and you've got a, a shepherd coming along behind. And this is how you might see it in the sky. This is up above Cusco, where you can see these dark cloud constellations in the Milky Way. I'd say that there's a kind of machista slant to these earlier texts, rather than acknowledgement of the female-centered discourse that we found, 
which is about women's being and her pathway of sound and all her different helpers, the rainbow, the breath spirits, the Elia stones, the birds, to breathe life and color into the herds and manage the transitions from above to below, from the celestial herds to the terrestrial ones. As I mentioned, breath is samana and color is sama in Aymara. One of the main female interests is in the creation of plentiful fleece, the male constellations that you saw coming along behind the female animal, they're called Father Pumpisito. It seems to come from Pumpinia in Aymara, which is a burnt dark gray, while Father Cusco is the name of another male llama. It's painted like the Incas with a dark purple. The black llama, as I said, is Hachataika, the great mother, or Hachakarwa, the big llama. And she's often called Han Sanakeri, she who never descends, because she's always up in the sky. She's suckling her young or feeding her calf with blood through her umbilical cord when the animals are born in around October onwards each year. And it's interesting that in the months at the end of the year from October to December, the black llama becomes particularly bloated and you can see that the celestial umbilical cord has come down to the horizon as a kind of procession of, of the Milky Way which comes right down to the horizon and, and the start and the, the little calf is still beyond the horizon, but you can see the umbilical cord there very clearly. Libations are made to these celestial llamas in June at the winter solstice and, and particularly around Christmas at the summer solstice during the rainy season when they traditionally remember the female llamas, whereas the males are acknowledged at New Year and the alpacas are remembered at Santa Guadalajara or Santa Barbara on the 4th of December. Different observers view the procession of the Dark Lake Lakes constellations in different ways, but they tend to agree that the condor goes first, followed by the black llamas, the human herders who are an old couple, and then the fox or the fox goes in front in some cases. And this order of procession is what grandparents look out for at night when they used to um, tell stories to their grandchildren at night when there was no electricity in the zone before the 1960s. They'd watch through the doorways as these different constellations came into the, the view from the doorway and that would sequence the tales they told. So they'd begin with a tale about the fox and the condor and then they go on to tales about the llamas and so on and so on. The elderly sky couple are said to send breath to the animals as they're mating. You've got this um, reiterating importance of breath, um, which produces these beautifully colored fleeces. So the celestial llamas too communicate with the terrestrial llamas through breath. The women's exegesis about the process of bringing the sky animals down from the heavens to the earth also concerns the water birds and the yamas in a kind of hydraulic cosmology. Doña Maria Aike explained to us how the yamas come down from the highest mountains in Kakuchaka, these are called Toru and Hochchu, with the flow of water over the rains according to a reciprocal agreement with the gods in the heavens. They say that the first agreement or the first reciprocal agreement was made with the sky father, the sun and the moon mother, who are the Inca gods, and then later on, they, these passed the power on to the high guardian mountains or, or Uguri of the place. And these until today are considered the true owners of the animals and the humans just borrow them. Hence the feeding of the mountains with animal sacrifices and they call them payments, um, borrowing from the Spanish pago. These ideas also relate to the rituals of animal inheritance when the mountains grant animals to the women of the Ayu via the Ilia miniature stones. These are little miniatures made from stone, which are, um, are used in rituals, probably to scale up the efficacy of a ritual. Um, there are stones out in the Ayu countryside, which are said to look like the llamas, and there's a myth of Mount Toro marrying Mount Hukchu, and yet the sun suddenly coming up, it was dark night, the sun comes up, the cock crows, and then they all turn into stone, and there they are. And you can see these lines of, of llamas in, in the stones up there. You can see here a woman unwrapping her 
India stones from a woven bundle during a ritual. Each kind of animal is thought to come down from different mountains and from different colored seams in the mountains in the rock faces. There are Ilya stones from a regional level. There's a great big one called Ilyantuku that generates the colored animals down to this domestic level where they tend to be the Bezua stones often found in a camelid's belly. And they're considered to have medicinal properties. And the llamas with these stones in the interior are thought to be special because they make noises. They go wah wah at the dark of the moon and the full moon. And um, they engage with the Samiri breath stones up on the mountains. Each household has a bundle of wrapped up Ilya stones, like you can see here, usually found by the women of a household and under, under the charge of the women. They're brought out in rituals to augment the herds and they're offered llama fat and, and llama offerings. Um, but although the Ilias are cared for by women and help augment their herds, they must be left to sons. The, the women try to have a son in the family. If there are no sons, then they have to be passed on to another family or abandoned. Um, but they're very much ritually in the hands of women who make the longest libations to these Ilya stones. The breath spirits called Samiri on the hillsides have color, brilliant sound and fertilizing power. And they're also considered to be, to give, uh, to engender animals. They're often of natural colors. They have some bird colors in them. They gleam again on the nights of the dark and the full moon. And they're thought to refract into the colored pathways or ribbons of red and white. And in, they help women in their paths of song. So the animals participate in this watery ecosystem, drinking the rivulets and returning this liquid to the earth as their sweat, urine, and excrement. And this is considered to be good luck, which in turn refertilizes the earth. So there's this whole this recognition constantly that it's a cycle of returning things to the earth. Um, and this whole cycle is called good luck or surti. This cycle is interestingly called mantensiona in Aymara, it's a, it's a colonial term. It comes from the Spanish word for maintenance. And it seems to have been a colonial term introduced into Aymara when Indian Spanish agreements about land use came into being. And even the Spanish conquerors and, and administrators were very aware of, of, of fertilizing the earth with um, the animal droppings and making sure that the earth was not overworked. There's also this idea of a watery inner world, Umatpatra, where the people go after death up in, in these dark lakes, and camelids are associated with water as a kind of water spirit par excellence, and also they're associated with the dead as a kind of psychopomp. The Amas are often killed when a man is killed so that they can accompany him in his journey to the other world. And, and yamas are also concerned with the recycling of ancestral souls. So you've got many ideas here, which are, came, again um, lock into lowland um, group ideas where the dead are thought to live below the water in lakes and rivers. In the ideas about the recycling of the animals, men and women request more animals from different places. Men tend to request them from the highest mountains, whereas women might um, request them from particular hills, which are called aviadores, which send the animals. And then the women have their miracle sites. These are saints concerned with miracles in, in places all across the south of Oruro and north of Potosi. And the women sing special songs to these saints and <clears throat> recognize as well the miniature ilias and waters and the breath spirits. Um, Apart from singing these songs for their own reared animals, I won't say domesticated because the animals are not considered to be domesticated as you have to, in each generation, bring them into human life by talking to them and singing to them. But they also are concerned with wild animals. So there are wild animals considered the parallels of these reared animals. And both men and women request animals from the high guardian mountains called Oyuwiri, which are the animal gamekeepers. These gamekeepers, sometimes they're called the master and the mistress of the animals, also have their own herder animals. Um, these are the wild mountain cats or other felines. 
who are said to be the real herders of the animals and which must be appeased with sacrificial offerings. Depending what, an, an, what color animals you want, you give offerings of maize grains of these particular colors. So these are the elementary particles of this Andean cosmology that the women in particular extend into this kind of cultural praxis of song making and herd creation. So let me go back now to the semantic link between the words for fleece, hawi, river, hawira, and so on, and hawi makunya to come out of the mother. There's also hawi tatanya to flood or spread with water. Tom Zoida and Gary Erden in their essay of 76 suggest that these links explain why in the colonial myths of Waruchiri, the celestial black llama is associated with a flood. They relate this passage to that part of birth concerning the releasing of the amniotic waters. And they wonder if this idea might be related to Cusco as the umbilicus of the Inca empire and the birthplace of the Inca dynasty. Our own interest was centered more in the relationship between these ideas and the birth of sound and song and the way these relations are established through the patterns of pathways and wrappings. We also perceive the songs to the animals as extensions of the popular songs called wine news. The rainy season wine news are sung first in the plaza dance floor, and it's perceived then as a giant loom. The four corners are like the four stakes of a loom, and they say that the coca cloth is unraveling into the dance figures and their colors, the colors of the people dancing in their clothes. And then these wine news spread all across the Ainu territory. Young people go out and, and, and sing them in their villages. They're sung to wake up the virgin earth from her slumbers so that cultivation can begin. And the singers refer to her time of year or her period, meaning the rainy season, talking about the virgin earth. So the songs to the animals are in some sense about how sound and color spread outwards in an organic pattern of granular and filament shaped elements with the wind and rains at this time of year. So what are the birthing habits of the celestial black llama? We saw that this happens from October to December each year in the rainy season. In Chris Knight's theory, there's this alternation between the rainy season and the dry season as a larger instance of that of the dark of the moon and the full moon. And here in the Andes, this notion of red pathway and white pathway also identifies women more with the rainy season there and the Earth's menstrual period and its celestial equivalents in the Milky Way, together with its generating of seasonal growth. Men are more identified with the dry season and, and with warfare that happens in the dry season, although they do take on the responsibility to prepare, prepare for the rainy season through their music and rituals. Men play panpipes during the rainy season, but they say that the waters the water gets stuck in these pan pipes and it can't come out until the rain season. So, so they do this ritual implicitly to help. Women in particular must help the celestial black yama and the virgin earth to give birth to the terrestrial herds in the heart of the rainy season. They do this through prayers, libations, remembering the mountains as the lord of the animals and the pastures, and they constantly observe the constellations to do this. Men also did this on their past journeys with their llama caravans to the valleys from the end of May at Pentecost until early August when they returned to the Ainu. And when they went down to the valleys, it's interesting that with this procession of the Milky Way, the, the black llamas were going down to the horizon as well. And the men would say that the celestial llamas would pee urine, <coughs> yuck, to bring on the rains. So there's a kind of male side to this. Um, and this word yak uh, for, for pea might be the etymology of the tale of Waruchiri, where the black yama is called yakana. This constellation of ideas is obviously quite ancient. Um, there's iconographic evidence from formative cultures like the Wankarani around Ururu, which is really the ancestral culture of, of areas like Kakachaka, where you've got these feet are these llama heads, but they're changing into felines. So you've got this um, transition metamorphosis going on here. Uh, in Pukara, which was uh, an earlier culture than Tiwanaku on the north of Lake Titicaca, 
you've got this kind of mistress of the animals here. She's holding a, an alpaca by a rope. And in her other hand, she's got a net bag and a kind of image of the moon at different phases. And she's wearing bird feathers and, she, and big tufu pins in her dress. Then uh, this is a Tiwanaku textile of yamas giving birth. If you can see, it's very dark, but you can see where I put the red rings around the little yamas coming out. And it's just like this, um, this Lyama looking back at, at a baby just coming out of her the vagina at the back um, in a real birth. As I said, the women consider the black Lyama to become more and more bloated through the latter part of the year with the rains inside her until she finally bursts, giving birth to the young herd animals and the food crops. They compare this process to the birth of the placenta and the amniotic liquid, and they compare this so the celestial fox falling down to earth in the well-known folktale and bursting on landing with all the food seeds inside him. The women observe how a baby llama's sleeping place is a particularly bloody place on the placenta, like a blanket, and how when the baby is born, the placenta comes out, comes out to become its first snack food. The placenta is closely observed after birth by those around. Its white membrane is separated out and called the soft and tender field, we call them to Naimara. And then the placenta membranes, amnion and chorion, are taken to some flowing water in the river nearby to float away and thence bring back hundreds more animals. The celestial black llama is thought to drink all of the celestial waters during the rainy season and then to spew them out as her urine and blood when she gives birth in December. And she makes this sound, pah. This phenomenon seems to condense all of the rainy season into one single rainy month, Halupaxi, as the women's red pathway. Same, the same for the virgin earth, who becomes red with the flowing rainwater over the muddy fields. Also, the female mm, spirits of the dead, the Hiramaihu, wear red skirts and green mantles, like the bloody earth itself and, and the sprouting green vegetation as their mantles. Women like the earth are thought to become pregnant when they grasp the seed of life with their blood. So they are but an instance of an immense cosmogonic menstrual period. Henceforth, all the new offspring, human, animal, and vegetable are called babies, wawa, in ritual language. For Doña Maria and Doña Lucia, this release of blood and all the other liquids releases the colors of the animal fleeces. The celestial helium must also pee out water, although this runs in ditches and irrigation canals and not as the rains. The women are aware that the local animals, especially the camelids, give birth during the rainy season, whereas the old world animals, the sheep and cows and so on, give birth during the dry season, so they're considered as quite different beings. You could say that the Andean ecosystem is like a part whole of mirrographic relations in Marilyn Strathern's terms. So just as the sky llama or the virgin earth have their blood, so women have their own blood, which makes them fertile from a hunting, herding logic. They openly compare their monthly menstrual cycles to the rainy season and the annual cycle. Doña Lucia explained how even women's menstrual cycles are controlled by the celestial black llama, who comes down to the horizon each full moon and new moon to help the breath spirits on the mountainsides to procreate, procreate the herd animals and women to become pregnant. There are particular taboos on these nights of the dark and the full moon to do with drinking water when the breath spirits are out and about and they're drinking this water too. So female menstrual cycles are like fractal buds of the wider cyclical rhythm of the black yama. In Aymara language, um, women reiterate this idea of seed and filament growth when they're talking about fleece formation, pasture formation, iliostones, or the human obstetrics of fetus and umbilical cord, while it feeds on the placental blood from the granular teats on the placenta's surface. Don Domingo notes that the mucus plug at the opening of the uterus, called tawaraku, tarwa is wool, has to be released before the amniotic waters can descend. The baby lives, but the placenta dies. The birth canal is called a gateway, punku. The baby is received onto a black llama hide and a wad of old cloth to soak up the blood. 
the babies moved to one side to allow the maternal blood to drain away on the earth. Note that dead bodies are treated rather like newborn babies, as a fine fleece is placed over the face. Tristan Platt notes how fetuses inside the womb are compared to mummified ancestral chulka people. The sky llama suckles her young, but on red blood or white blood as milk. Immediately after a birth, people are quiet, but then the chatter increases in volume to an exuberant level of sound. The new mother must not sleep as malignant spirits are all around. Bystanders beat wooden spoons or a wooden cup on her side to stop her from sleeping until the placenta appears. They say that female ancestors are hovering all around and could suffocate the life out of her. So making sound is atropopeic to ward off these ancestral spirits. In rural communities, postpartum hemorrhage is a very real risk, particularly as they take herbs to speed up the labor. And this can be risky for postpartum hemorrhage. And the early cutting of the umbilical cord recommended by some people does not help. Finally, the placenta is buried with some salt just inside the threshold to mark the female bloodline, and gradually the sound sinks back to its normal pitch. Women midwives say that the rain clouds rising from the earth are her breath and relate how the clouds dance like hunks of fleece. As helpers of the sky liana, they give her strength, and when the rain falls, they give energy to the earth, making her sprout with the crops and give birth to all the flowers. The people of Kakachaka love this time of year and they insistently ask for photographs of them in their fields. In the dry season, everything is lifeless in comparison. The dust makes it all dirty and weavers use duller colors in their textiles as compared to the vibrant colors they use in the rainy season when they also use the designs of, of um, flourishing pathways of growth of the flowering vegetation. From the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady in October until Carnival in February or March, they celebrate these vibrant colors as they sing their popular wine news. The women emphasize that whereas ordinary llamas get old and can no longer have young, the celestial llama is always young and can always give birth, hence she's called Winyai Taika, eternal mother. There are childbirth taboos. When women are pregnant, they're considered to be full of blood and they can't spin or weave as they say the baby can be strangled or else the umbilical cord will wrap around its neck. Neither should they weave complex designs nor sit with the sun on their backs as the placenta can stick to the uterus walls. There's mainly a female centered discourse around the sky back with black yama as an epicenter of all things female, grasping, wrapping, giving birth, weaving, singing. However, there is this male discourse that I've mentioned that concerns dark colored male blood and the physical strength of the male herd animals under their charge. Blackness for men is like redness for women. And Don Domingo explained how it concerns animal fat and dense and strong blood good for sacrifice and how he often calls on the other dark cloud constellations such as the fox to enrich these substances in his animals. He also related how the earthly llamas often drink from places where the rainbow lurks, and this can give them beautiful colors. He acknowledges this is why sacrifices are made on the 1st of June as offerings to the mountains. The llamas know they're going to die and that their strength will pass on to the humans that care for them. Women, for their part, love the colors of the rainbow, but fear it as it can pursue them and make them pregnant. Don Domingo says the granular stars give their strength to men, whereas the dark lakes in the Milky Way give their strength to women. In general, though, women are much more interested in color than men as they use fleece colors for their weavings, and they like rainbow colors and use them particularly in their belts. Belts for them are like the colored seams in the rocks where the animals come from, and they use belts in childbirth to help push the baby out. The equivalent men are slings and lightning. Blood is considered to be so powerful that besides pregnancy and childbirth taboos, there are menstrual taboos. A menstruating woman should not go into a cultivated field. A woman should not look at her blood in childbirth, but avert her eyes. But a woman giving birth can make sound, even wail or scream. Donya Maria confirmed how all things devilish, sahra, are linked to blood, 
on how women have their blood at the dark of the moon or the full moon. Women tend to stay at home on these days as something sacra or something diabolical might enter their bellies. There are particular places that are considered devilish, like this Sky River, um, Devil River, where there are many powerful stones um, that flows in this ravine called Kosmi Uma, where the river has multiple colors in its waters, like the colors they want for their weavings, but it has this dangerous quality. Or else there's this rock face here that usually the water cascades down and it's got an opening into the underworld where the teal and the devils are all making lots of things in their factories. They're like black holes that can eat people up where rainbows and sirens and Ilya stones dwell. So looking back at these ideas now with hindsight, um, I just mentioned some common threads that link these notions of human bodies and blood flow and the necessity of sacrifices to the mountains to assure the con continuity, continuity of reciprocal relations between mountain guardians as the true owners of the animals and the, the herders that just border them. And, and the herders fear of predation by the wild feline mountain herders if offerings are not made to them and the moral obligations triggered by these ritual complexes. I mentioned in passing how the term karma in Aymara means both life and menstrual blood. Karma also refers to the main trunk of the body, including the stomach, but also the belly. Within the body, karma refers to that which breathes, presumably the lungs, when mention is made of the way the virgin earth makes the clouds breathe to bring on the rains. Women in particular make offerings to the virgin earth of red llama fiber, cocoa leaves and meat, to persuade her to renew the pastures on the hillsides with her rains each year, and hence the animal coverings or wrappings of meat and fat. In the gendered aspects of these ideas, men are said to express the power of their karma through their spiritedness, their, their animal as individuals, particularly their power to frighten another being through a show of courage, kamasa. Kamasiniwa means one who has courage, Kama can refer to a man's luck, whether in battle or in his ability to hunt or rear animals. Women, on the other hand, are charged with cycling Kama in a more collective sense, through their preparation of food to fill the stomachs of their families and of everyone present when there are fiestas. Importantly for a woman, her Kama refers to her sexual rhythms and her reproductive potential and outcomes. During her monthly period, said to coincide with the dark of the moon or the full moon, the expression Kamakiyosaraski means her blood is flowing. Adult women are considered more fertile when this blood first appears and when it's about to disappear, and this is when she should have sexual relations if she wants to get pregnant. Then when a woman, give, woman gives birth, her preordained tendency to have an easy or difficult de delivery is described as her kamiri. Each woman is said to have her own particular tendency in this, so she, she might have a normal human tendency and have some difficulty. But if she has the tendency of a wild animal, such as a vicunya, vicun kamiri, she'll give birth effortlessly up in the hills and be able to walk back home afterwards. If she has the tendency of a reared animal, or you were kamiri, then beware. She'll age faster than a woman with a person's tendency, and she might have regular affairs with men other than her husband. So the range of meanings of kama and its derivatives for a woman regulate her sexual life, her blood flow and predisposition for an easier or more difficult childbirth. So these ideas about kama in particular begin to articulate the alternative domains of reciprocity and predation in the ambit of human mountain relations and to unravel the wider moral obligations set into motion in each sphere of activity. Reciprocal care here, I'd say, is linked more to the female domain and expressed through feeding, the provision of wealth in food, food products and animals acquired through the luck of having accomplished the right offerings and breeding animals correctly. Associated ideas concerning mutual rearing by clothing and wrapping, whether through offerings or by ensuring the provision of new meaty and fatty layers or fleece layers, all in women's hands. So the meanings of kama here emphasize mutuality and these more collective aspects of reciprocity. As a corollary to this female collectivity are the more predatory aspects linked to male courage, prowess, 
spiritedness and luck and male sexuality and the release of male seed to make women pregnant. A vital link between these two domains is through the stomach and the belly, the stomach that receives food or the belly that receives, that gives out blood flow and receives seed to become pregnant. Um, I might just play you a few bars of the women's songs just to finish this. Here are the women marking the animals or directing the men how to mark the animals. My notebooks trying to work out what these songs were about. Um, here you can hear the libations just before the songs. Can you hear the sound of that? I think the sound is the sound coming through or is it it's very weak? Um, I can't hear. I can. No. Let me just try this again. So here's the song. Mm. Nothing. You can't hear it. I can't hear. Anybody? No. Yeah. Don't think we can, sadly. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll just show you a couple of things that are interesting in the songs that it starts from a, a very simple verse like Mama Lita, Mama La Pau Pau, Kuma Pina, Mama La Pau Pau. And then you stretch out the verses into longer and longer verses. Um, like this one, Sarat, Sarat Mai, Sarat ma Mama La Pau Pau, Umai. And they say it's like pulling out fleece. Um, and you've got this kind of rhythmic cell, which is then stretched out into couplets and so on. So they're relating song to, to wool, um, stretching out hanks of wool into mm. fleece. Mm. And in the animal mating ceremony, it's interesting that they compare the animal mating to the courtship dance of, of grebes <laughs> to the bottom of a lake and bring up this algae and, and, and their heads yeah. dark. Um, and when the llamas are mating here, um, they say that they look like grebes, like you see. <laughs> so I'll finish there. And um, it's a pity you can't hear the songs. Oh, no, it's sad. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. That's just so such a beautiful descript description and detailed and intricate, um, you know, laying out of of what uh, of, of of the cosmology. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and Amy's making a suggestion. Uh, switch to sharing the sound with the computer mic instead of headphones mic. Can you make that work? Let me just see. Hold on. Or play it loudly from your computer and we can hear on the Zoom. Possible. Yeah, if I just do this. Hold on. Is that better? play a little of the the mating song um if i can get the sound to come up this time yeah. 
an idea it's Wonderful. this wide 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 chulium because the grebes go diving down right into the water and, and the mammals are regarded as these kind of water dwelling spirits as well so okay wonderful so so exactly what's the the grebes are mating and of course the grebes are water birds and water is the source of everything fertile and, and yes. so are, 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 is that a metaphor for the llamas curling the necks around each other as they're having sex up in the sky in the in the black well if you watch grebes mating which i used to do in the city we, we definitely have camilla showed me them in uh, battersea park and the lake they, they, they have this beautiful dance um courtship this famous dance llama mating has to be controlled by humans um they get very very worried if male animals are ever around on these troops of llamas going down to the valleys because if they mount a female they can kill her by their weight and aggressiveness so they have a very controlled llama mating ceremony when they're brought in and they put these beautiful colored weavings over them according to the colors that the women want they're also looking at the stars in the dark constellations and they lift up little corners of the weavings to let colors in from the stars and so on to to get the markings they want and um it's all very amusing, but anyway, they do look like griefs having sex, and um, <laughs> so that's the that's the essence of it. So it's it's all this interfacing of sky to earth, but also to the water, and so all these different different domains. Yes, yes. I mean, they're very they're looking above. In the first days of August, they observe the stars and everything that's happening in the natural world to try and foresee the year ahead and they used to be able to do this until climate change and now it's all chaos uh -huh. um, but they do make all these observations and particularly people like don domingo he would have watched everything for three days and be be making libations constantly looking at uh, what was going to happen in the year and telling people where to plant whether to plant high up or low down depending on how the weather was going to unfold yeah. we're saying so much about the um the water birds, they have to be water birds about the lakes, the rivers, the floods, the, the, and, and, and um, you, you were, I was sort of wondering, I wonder, are there any powerful dry spirits? And of course, then you explain that actually the dry season is not really very fertile and it's the, it's the, it's the it's linked with the men and the men do have a bit of, they have, they have a bit of warfare in the dry, <laughs> the dry season. But if you want real power and fertility, you really, that's not the place to look. You know, it's nothing. Nothing dry is going to be powerful in any kind of magical sense, is it? And uh, so it's there, just beautiful stuff. It's just so. There are other other places around the lake where Juan was from. Um, there are there are things more like a rainbow snake that are supposed to come up out of Lake Titicaca, and they they're like these kind of felines that have fire and coming out of them like dragons, and and they go across, and they're rather dangerous unless you're a very strong shamanic person and they can um, is, is that fire them. going to be the kind of lightning that strikes a person that makes them into a shaman or, or, or midwife it might be. It might yeah, be. i think i think that's i think that's what um there is first called celestial fire yes. so very yeah. careful to distinguish celestial fire from domestic fire and yes. domestic fire is not magic at all but celestial yes. fire most certainly is linked with the darkness and the storms and the wet Yes, it's it's different. There are these um, kind of spirits that come out of watery places in in Kukachaka as well, but they're more like local spirits, and they come up making these noises and flashing lights, and people can see them at certain times of year. Just one more question, and I'll stop. It's um, it's just interesting that the felines you you said are often the mistress or master. The game. Of the animal of the game animals it's so 
it's sort of beautifully contradictory and paradoxical because I've, I presume that the felines are also quite dangerous to the animals, but um, at least from a they human are. perspective. They yeah. are dangerous, but then they're, you know, as we've seen in the rag classes, they are the peak, um, the yeah. prime um, predators, the apex predators. And, apex and they, predators. They check the health of the animals as well. You certainly um, check, it, check the health, yes. <laughs> a very kind of um, romantic things about the Andes, about reciprocal relations and everything. But if you really look at the power of the moral obligations that make people do all the rules of herding and make the sacrifices at their proper moment, then there are these aspects of predation and they are the ones that have the power to control these moral obligations. And they're very wrapped up with these game master, gamekeeper figures. Yeah. Uh, yes, and, uh, and just, um, and of course you have the, um, the, the karma, it sort of reminds me a little bit of Jerome's Aquila. I think it's, yes, it's not that it different, is it? Yeah. I think uh, I, I found that there were very many similarities there and the way that um, men and women as groups have these different kind of relations that come together in these. Uh, the, the, women's, the women's karma is much more collective and the men's karma tends to be sort of predatory yeah. and individualistic. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think that works with uh, Aquila as well. Uh, um, to, to an extent, I think with the, with the, with the, mm -hmm. Ben and Jerry, the, the women are much more likely to be singing together. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought, um, of course it's in my book to an extent, um, I've always thought that the, um, the sound of the singing, especially when it's turned into bull roarers, is the sound of the blood. I mean, it's, it's, if it's rhythmic, it's kind of the sound of the, the, the pulse, the, the heartbeat, the a sound you know you heard before when you were in your mother's womb. Um, so, all of that is so um, so suggestive of, of, of something really is a, a, just a, an extraordinarily beautiful variation on a, on a on a theme which is kind of everywhere. Um, the, the yes, of, I know. do wish that we could find somebody working in South Africa and those places because they do have songs to the animals there, and and it's about yeah. working with the animals and it has these kind of rhythms. So it'd be very interesting to compare them. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes, meaning yes. meaning these um, herders. Herders. We're talking about yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm potentially the himba would be really interesting about that. I don't know if it's there, but it may be koi koi. Um, yeah. Maybe we could ask Roy Ashton, who's doing Kalahari sign. I, I, I think it may. I'm not sure if he's working with with but herders over there, but I mean, it'd herders. be interesting to get somebody. There. No, I know. No, I know. I know he's not, but, um, but yeah. I know. It'd be interesting to find out. Yeah. yeah. Has anybody um, got questions for Denise? Um, people asking in the chat about what it feels like to spend time with these communities because you've lived um, in the areas for quite a significant time. Well, I know. I mean, it was wonderful, um, you know, during this early period it was absolutely fascinating you learned so much from those people now it's uh, it's quite dangerous and there is um you know there's an awful lot of cocaine production and factories and so on and, and the way of life has changed quite dramatically so yeah um a lot of that world has gone um, yeah but it was it's called progress it, yeah i mean the oral tradition people would recite things going right back into the time of the Incas and it was quite fascinating when I checked up on um, colonial documents you know these dates are around <clears throat> 1600 and so on and talking about earlier so that world was there until schooling and uh, electric lights and uh, and cocaine factories. Yeah. yeah and it is so moving to hear about the storytelling looking through the doorways this this incredibly sort of just from home being able to make these observations of the constellations and the movement of the of the milky way is, is just such a beautiful description because of course it's very suggestive of of the realities of what might have happened also in neolithic europe that they would have used these openings to make frame the sky in just the same sorts of ways um, yes. with those yeah. stories who needs stonehenge um, if you can see it from your yeah. own doorway yeah absolutely <laughs> M mary you've got your hand up you want to go mm, 
And thanks, Denise. Thank you so much for this presentation. And the, the pictures were so beautiful. I had never realized that the Ila stones were sculpted. I had never seen any picture before. So I just imagined they were just regular stones, uh, like some of those beautiful stones taken from the mountains, the one, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> So all the Ila stones are sculpted, all of them, aren't they? Well, the little ones, uh, well, these ones are, are like carved ones, but they do have ones of bunny shapes, which are the, are the Bezwa stones uh, that they find in their animals. And then- what the, uh, what, they, Can you they, explain the Bezwa stones? Because people won't know what that is. Um, what do we call them in English? I mean, it's got some funny name in Latin or something, the agro, India. Somebody, can somebody remember? Um, yes, um, I read the name before, but um, uh, gastrolis, gastrolis, yes, gastrolis. That, 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 um, so the stones formed in the stomachs. In the calcium of the stomach. Ah, ruminant creatures, and they come out in funny forms, and people scrape them and use them for medicines and. Um, look at the, the forms and the forms have different meanings um so they are important but then they do call ilia stones stones at lots of different levels um i mean there are places <coughs> in peru where they have these rock carvings and they are landscape carvings so they're like miniatures of a whole landscape that you will then work and, and create terraces and so on um and in, in Mesoamerica as well, there are people working and, and they do have similar things and, and they're, they're suggesting that they're using for scaling up or scaling down rituals or work um, ventures. So they're ways of focusing your mind on, on something at different scales. Which so Denise, also the, the Ila stones, they are given um, from the mother to the son. They pass on from the mother to the son. And then, yes. um, then what happens then? Yeah. What, what does the son... Uh, yeah, how does that work? Yeah, how is it transmitted again then? Where? Well, a household will have its two... Um, two lines, it will have the bloodline and the semen line, so the, the men will inherit and have the herds through the household which remain in one place and the women's herds will go off with them at marriage to their husband's house or their husband's family house. So you've got the herds dividing up constantly and so the importance in the rituals for the women are remembering the long genealogies of, of mm and the maternal line of the, the female reproducers mm. where men are more concerned with the stud animals and so on um, and the Elia stones are seem to be concerned with, with particular households so a woman will have her Elia stones from her natal household but when she goes to her husband's household she will be required to be responsible for the, the Elias of that household I do pass oh, down. No. Okay, I see. And and one last thing about them: who sculpted them? Who what? Sorry. Uh, who who sculpt the last stones at the beginning? Well, I who don't know. There are sculpt? these people that sculpture these stones, and and you know you can put um, substances in, in or flowers or whatever into their backs, um, and. I mean, they pick up stones that have a kind of form, like we pick up stones on the beach or something, and then they sculpt them. I mean, anyone can sculpt them into a kind of form you want, but then there are obviously specialized sculptors of these things. And I, I don't, I can't really say uh, who does that. I imagine that they are people associated with particular powers that um, do carve these things, like with weaving, you know, the, the, the weaving, um, picks that the women use to, to beat the, the warps down. Um, you know, there are particular people called pakos who do that and who know how to smoke bones and carve bones. So it must be another, another kind of person like that. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. John. John. 
Hello, Denise. Um, I, I wonder whether you came across any uh, reference, specific reference to star color. Um, yes, they do talk about these star colors and that's what they do when they're doing this mating ritual and they're lifting up the corners. There, there is an article, I'm not sure whether it's in English, it might be in English and I could send it to you, but um, we did do an article about that and, and somebody, some archaeologists said it was very similar to things that they'd found from the middle horizon going right back in time. But they do think that certain stars have certain colors like Venus and so on, and then, and then they will lift up the, um, the weavings in these particular places to try and get particular markings on the animals, you know, a patch of light or a patch of redness or a patch of um, a dark color. So there, there is this knowledge about star colors, but I'm not an expert on it. Um. Edward, do you want to come in or do I need to read the question? Um, uh, Edward's asking about rituals or songs around the production of dye and particularly red dye. Is that possibly? Um, it's difficult to get close to that information because nowadays, <laughs> This kind of reciprocal idea about everybody being equal and everything in, in the Andes um, took over really in the last 50 years. And if you talk to grandparents and they talk about their grandparents, then you're going back to a world where there were real specialist dyers mm -hmm. and people would go down to the valley lands and visit the houses of these special dyers. And, um, and they would do red with um, with plant colors, and they would do the cochineal dyeing of red. Um, and some of the dyes would be kept in blood to preserve the intensity of their colors. Wow. Um, now, if you go back like these three or four generations, then you're going to find that um, people couldn't wear all the colors like they do now. Ordinary people, inahake, could only use natural colors and a very sparse use of any other colors. It was the kind of noble elites that could use dyed colors, particularly red and blue. Mm. Um, so there was a very different world of great expertise and people would um, use kipu um, knotted threads to 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 um, to see how many dyes they were doing the intensity of the immersions in the dyes and who could use what colors and these people would also know particular regions and how the authorities should be dressed and what motifs and colors should be in their garments so in their textiles so people would go and they might be rather ignorant, but know that they were coming up to be kind of some authority in the ivy. And so they would have to go to these people and learn about it. Now that knowledge has been lost with all this kind of um, equality discourse. Okay, so yeah, mm, yes, yeah. So, so we can't um, describe the, this is, as having any connection with a, a egalitarianism, really, the Andean um, traditional, the Aymara traditions. It, well, it would be like we hierarchized. It's so complex that uh, if you go back into the late colonial and early Republican period, then you do get these tremendously fine weavings and fine designs mm. and amazing colors. And um, people are rescuing these now in the modern world. Um, Elvira Speckle, who, who I worked with for a long time, does this, and, and she has reproduced some of these wonderful colors through lots and lots of experimentation with very nasty smelling substances, <laughs> and she's done it. But uh, there is this other world there of, of great expertise and of individuals that were great masters in their craft. Mm. And Generally, you can't say that today. It's a more shared out knowledge and a group of women in, in, in Kakachaka today might all die 
Right. and reds and so on together if they've got right. enough to meal or whatever so mm -hmm. it's a much more collective effort hmm. yeah that's interesting have we got any other questions anybody thinking about um, let's do some thoughts you, you mentioned that a, a, a large proportion of the shamans were midwives mm -hmm. men Yes. Is, is, is that, that an intrinsic connection between being a, sh a shaman and a, mid and a midwife? Is it something which a really good shaman should be? Um, well, it's interesting you should say that. Um, of the people I know, uh, there was another man, Dom Alberto, who I don't mention here, but he was at like um, a pediat pediatric equivalent. He would look after young children's illnesses and setting of bones and you know, hip um, corrections and so on. So yes, it is an ability that people have uh, who are who are shamans who have been struck by lightning. Struck by lightning. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean now now it's completely different. I've just marked a thesis and I, it, it's all new age and it's about twenty five year old shamans being great <laughs> experts and and so on and. And they've done this by taking ayahuasca, which is not an Andean substance at all. And they go to these kind of really? groovy, groovy places and, and meet and, and recover their identity in, in these places. Um, it's very yeah. different from these older people who were struck by lightning, like Don Domingo, and wow. he, who's, who had a limp. You know, I mean, it's a very dangerous thing. Sure. And, um, and it happened to him quite young. Um, that some midwives, also had strange markings on their arms, for instance, and, and that would give them a particular ability. There was one Doña Hortensia who we worked with who, who mm -hmm. was like this. Mm -hmm. But that this uh, the world is changing very fast. And how, how much are the Aymara themselves like aware? I mean, how, how conscious are they of that? Is a very strong generational. There is a very strong generational um, difference and, and you know I mean it's a war between the generations because the older generation mm -hmm. um, were ashamed to be Indians and they forbade their children from learning Aymara and from doing a lot of rituals and now and so a lot of people in their late teens and early 20s are having to go to these places to rediscover Aymara language and they're they're renaming themselves as Wara Wara, the little stars, or Luli Luli, a pick up a, um, a hummingbird, and so on and so on. And, and they're called Yahakalin or, or Jahani or something, and um, modern, modern names, Jenny. Uh, and and um, they're, they're going through it to, to, to rediscover mm -hmm. this thing. But they're rediscovering it in a very strange way with these urban right. shapes. And even in anthropology of the Andes, I mean, you know, the, the latest thing is, is coming out of Cusco New Age shamans and, and, you know, filtering through to us through certain authors who I won't mention, but um, it's a, it is very different. And what about your own work and your own work with Jose? Has that um, been valued because it's given some, you know, it's been able to preserve a certain amount? Yes, people are still very interested in it, and there are lots and lots of readings of it up on Academia Edu and so on. So, yeah, I mean, people are still aware that there was that world that we, we managed to describe, you know, in a number of publications. Um, so it does, and, and, and these young people do cite that, but then they have these inventions of etymologies and mm. so on that, um, mm. that are, are pretty loony kind of ideas. So it's, it's a real... Right mix up and what what if I can jump in again before we ask Mary just in terms of it because there's this intricacy of the jet of the gender relations this weaving together these lineages and and the um inheritance and so on um but how is that reflected in the new traditions is there the same kind of kind of subtlety in that gender well you know, in traditional musical things, the women would sing and the men would play these musical instruments. A woman might play a little drum, a tambour, but 
mainly the, the pipe music was in the hands of men. And there's a whole male world, which is another whole lecture about the, the use of pipes and the way pipes would, you know, bring the rains and so on. Um, but in the new groups, of course, they want to have international gender relations. So the women want to play the pipes and do all the other things. And the men sing with these feminine voices, you know, and these kind of... <laughs> <laughs> so oh it's goodness. all um, it's all experimental and and you kind of, I say to them you know well, what about all these other things about a, ma a male world but they're not really interested anymore oh dear <laughs> Ma Mary yeah okay I was just wondering about this um the division between the woman in their menstruation, some menstruate at dark moon and some menstruate at full moon. And the, the division is not, you know, like in, a, in Chris's theory. I was wondering if the, this division, is it only physiologic in the woman or is there any other sign in, in their daily life? Are they distinguishing each other in any other way or is it just, um, in a kind of hidden physiologic way. Do you understand my question? Um, yes. Uh, you know, I, there's not a hard and fast rule. They'll generally say you menstruate at the dark or the full moon, or you might begin menstruating on one and then it switches to the other behold. Um, and, th and that's quite common even in the Western world. But Menstruation is not a kind of hidden thing, um, although they have these fears of the rainbow and, and certain beings that might enter them. I mean, girls will just go around and, and blood will come down their legs and they'll just scrape it up with their foot or something and get on with a dance or whatever they're doing. So <laughs> it's not there's not a kind of hot up thing about keep, keeping it really private or anything. Even today, Denise, yes. Well, that, you know, I'm talking about the, these rural communities that I know best. Mm. Um, yes. In the city, mm. it's another thing. Uh, but yeah. uh, they w there would be these taboos, but it wasn't uh, an absolute, you know, taboo on women not being seen or heard if, and, and being shut away in a menstrual hut. Um, there are these common activities that would be the... They, they would go to spinning nights together and all spin and tell tales and, and sing these songs. So there, there was a space for women to do those things at night, but during daytime and so on, they would just um, get on with whatever they were doing. Thank you. Any more questions? Do you, want, do you want to say a bit, Camilla, about next term? Um, yeah, we're nearly we're nearly eight o'clock, I suppose. Um, yeah, that I just say. Well, we'll we'll come back to Denise if anyone's got some more questions um, or to say thank you. Um, but yeah, we're we're not going to do another rag talk before Easter until um, April twenty sixth. Now, so it's three weeks but I hope people will rejoin us. And then on April 26th, we are hosting Helga Vierick, um, who gave us a beautiful talk last year. Um, and she's gonna be talking about Kua Bushman as sacred narratives, um, which uh, include a story of um, the tale of the buffalo wife, a quite extraordinary Kua story of animal wife. Um, and uh, it should be very, uh, both very interesting, very funny, very interesting. Um, so I think uh, a lot of rag people will be very interested in, in analyzing those, those stories. And they are also stories, both from the Kua and um, other Kalahari Bushmen, which will have this linkage between women and animals and um, blood and fertility, this idea of ideology of blood, it will be very powerful in those stories, just kind of reminiscent of what Denise has been telling us about today. Um, otherwise, if, if nobody has any questions, then we just got to say thank you so much to Denise. That's, that is just such beautiful material. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I think everybody's been under a spell listening to that. So thank you very, very much. Yeah, sure. um, hope we'll be seeing you soon in this part of the world if we can. <laughs> so goodbye and thank you so much. Thank you, Liet, for the recording as well. Thank you. See you next.